ready? It's how every live stream starts with me asking Dave how much time we have. Oh, if you would please stand with us. Um, everything that is bothering you right now, I assure you, if you need to pick it back up, it will be out there when you leave. Let's set our minds straight. Let's focus on worshiping God. Give him this time.
to me.
thank you for the group we have assembled. I thank you for all those watching at home. Father God, I thank you for you being you. Father God, I thank you that you give us this opportunity to cry out, renew a right spirit within me. I pray that you would create in me a clean heart, that you would break this heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That actually wasn't a planned transitional moment, though it could have been. I accidentally left my stuff down there, but I think if you know me long enough, I've never done anything that premeditated in my life. I'm the same guy that proposed to his wife before we ever dated, so I, I just don't plan things out the best sometimes. If you ever need an, an uh, just an agonizingly awkward love story, I will tell you about how I eventually convinced my wife to marry me. It wasn't that she wasn't interested in me. My delivery is that bad. Just gonna say it. Anyway. <laughs> Welcome. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I make this claim quite a bit because it's true quite a bit. Um, that is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible for me. And I've always looked for an opportunity to yell that, and it's never happened. Um, except for when I'm reading it, of course, the behold the Lamb of, the, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I can't think of a casual moment where you can just throw that in. Someday I'll probably scream it at the park just to see what people do. Which sounds like a joke, but I'm being totally serious. I would love to see people's reaction. Would they be drawn to that statement, or will they, they increase their social distance? All right. Um, so we're taking a slight break from our Old Testament journey that we've been doing through the story um, because it's Lent, and I know Anabaptists aren't huge on Lent typically, but we always do have a Lenten series. Um, I'm not telling you what I gave up because that would defeat the purpose. I know most Anabaptists, most Protestants, most non-Catholics don't do Lent, and that is fine. Uh, I found it to be a really great exercise in just self-denial, uh, which I think really is uh, underrated as far as spiritual growth, self-denial. The biggest way that people do that uh, scripturally is through fasting, which in, uh, you know, in our McDonald's culture isn't really a priority for most people. We have an abundance of food, and it never really strikes us that we could uh, gain something from self-denial. It really isn't the being hungry. It's denying yourself something that's primal. Um, anyhow. So we are into this Lenten series, and I think the perfect place to start is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, which begins actually at his baptism. And I have something from all four Gospels that I'm planning to read. But the baptism of Jesus causes a lot of conversation in Christian circles simply because John is baptizing for, the, for repentance, for people to turn away from their sins. 
Jesus is not sinful, yet he is baptized. And uh, I'm hoping to discuss four reasons for that, and then one reason that gets attributed to that, which is just uh, full-blown crazy. Uh, it was actually dismissed as a heresy in the second century and still shows up in uh, some sermons as being biblically sound. So I'm probably going to talk about that for a moment. I'll try not to go nuts on the negative and stick with uh, what God wants us to see. So I'm going to start at uh, Matthew 3. Matthew 3. Um, which actually begins with John the Baptist prepares the way. John the Baptist, as you know from the nativity story, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus, roughly. And they are relatives. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt he, and said, Get up, take the child. And, oh, excuse me, I'm way back, too far. I'm in verse two, or chapter 2 there. I'll move ahead, forgive me. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. over Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. This is something that I actually had overlooked, is he is actually still kind of in the wilderness. He is not in a highly populated area. People are coming to find him to be baptized, to repent from their sins. Another thing I like to obsess about is the bizarrety of his diet of eating locusts and wild honey. But if you look in Leviticus under clean foods, you can eat grasshoppers. Just in case you were wondering how God feels about you eating grasshoppers, it is sanctioned. They are clean. Yet somehow shrimp didn't make that list, and I find that a little troubling. But since I'm no longer under that covenant, I'm hoping to have some garlic shrimp in my near future. Anyway, that was a side note. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that these, from these stones God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already on the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the, fleshing, the threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning the shaft with an unquenchable fire. Now that doesn't sound very complimentary to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees aren't actually this arch villain like in Superman. It isn't the Lex Luthers. It's not the, I, I don't know, I don't watch very many movies anymore. Uh, who are other movie bad guys? Magneto? I, I don't know. Um, he, he's not, these aren't arch villains. These are the religious people. These are the churchgoers. These are the ones that try their best to keep God's law. However, it's all very external. It's all for show with many of these people. Not every Pharisee is a bad guy. I have a slight obsession with Nicodemus, which I'm sure I will reference often, because he uh, seems to really desire and really follow after Jesus and maybe a little more of a bizarre way, but I, I really do love the example of Nicodemus, who does come out of that really orthodox style of worshiping God. Um, but these aren't horrible people. These are people that within their own strength are trying to follow God. Sometimes it's for the prestige, but some of these people are probably quite devout, you know, really have good motivation 
But it's all external because that's all that's really required by the law is the external. And they take a great deal of uh, their identity from being sons of Abraham. We're children of Abraham. It's, it's the Mennonite game on steroids. Well, my grandmother was a Troyer, and my, my father-in-law was, was an herb, and, uh, you know, there's some, some weavers and hostetlers. And there's nothing wrong with having those last names, by the way. If I'm going to start making fun of those last names, I'm going to have to find a new job really fast, I'm sure. But uh, it's like the Mennonite game on steroids. We're sons of Abraham, right? Uh, you take a lot of identity from being of the right pedigree because only the sons of Levi are really the priests, right? And only, or the sons of Aaron are the priests. The Levites serve in the temple. And in the Bible, you can see where it shows the genealogy to make sure that you belong where you're at. But he's telling them, don't take all this comfort in being sons of Abraham. God can raise sons of Abraham out of these stones. Have a heart in keeping with repentance. And then here at verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him because the opening question I have, he's baptizing people for repentance. He tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up from the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I loved, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. That's the account we have from the book of Matthew. And I'm just going uh, through. I'm going to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I know. Not very original in the way I decided to go through this. I had a thematic thing I was working with, but anyway. In the book of Mark, we have another repeat right at the beginning. Actually, I'm going to go ahead right to the very beginning, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I love Mark's gospel, and the reason I love Mark's gospel is it's the action movie of the gospels. It's just what happened, and then they move on. There isn't a lot of genealogy. There's not a lot of extra details. It's like a man telling a story, and then this happened. And there's something about John that's just really great because it's so concise, just... And this is what happened. So Mark is fun in that way. Did I just say John? I meant Mark. Forgive me. There's something about Mark I really enjoy simply because it's so concise. But he starts out just right from the beginning. He says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He also doesn't include a genealogy. He doesn't include uh, the birth of Christ. He doesn't, believe in, he doesn't include any childhood stories. He begins at the beginning of Christ's ministry. Because in Mark's head, I believe this is what people need to know. He cut out all the fluff, or what he would have considered to be fluff, and he just tells you what's happening. So if you're not as familiar with scripture reading and you want to know the story of Jesus, I would highly recommend Mark. Just details. And there you have it. If you want it to be really full, with a lot of details, Luke. If you want to see over and over again that Jesus is the Son of God, read John. If you want to see how Jesus fits into a Jewish context, read Matthew. I suggest reading all of them because three of them are synoptic. They tell the same stories. And then John just saw things a little differently. It doesn't conflict but you see the emphasis from John's perspective, and you see the emphasis from Luke's perspective, and you see the emphasis from Mark's perspective, and from Matthew's perspective. In fact, you see an example in the, the book of Matthew where there's a woman who's been sick, and it, it mentions the detail that she spent all her money on doctors but was still sick. Matthew's a tax collector. He thinks in money. 
She spent all her money and she's still sick. Luke, who's a doctor, doesn't mention that detail, that she'd been to all the doctors and was still sick because he's a doctor. It's not his fault. It's not the doctor's fault. <laughs> you can see these little moments that are just beautiful, all within the divine and inspired word of God. You have these little parts of the human author's personality that I adore, and it gives a different perspective. And as a historian, that actually reinforces the value of it historically. Because if it was verbatim over and over from different authors, well, that's mythology. You don't see the real humanity in that. Anyhow, that was a bunny. I chased them. In case you're not used to my public address method, I call it the beagle method, where I start in this really sound place with the master, and then I chase this bunny way out in a circle, and then I come back to where he's at, and then I kind of do it again until I've chased every scent there is. And anyhow, uh, and then we move on. So uh, Mark starts with that same quote from Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. Oh, that's actually from Malachi. I'm sorry, that one's from Malachi. I apologize, and that one's slightly different. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. The thongs of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him into the desert, and he was in the desert for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Again, every other story has a little buffer between, before, or every other gospel has a little buffer before it jumps into Jesus being tempted in the desert. Mark jumps right into it. He doesn't have any time to waste. And I ask, actually think, because uh, historically Mark is thought to have been a disciple of Peter. And Peter's personality is very much like that as well. When it's time for somebody to step out of the boat, it's Peter. When it's time for an answer, it's Peter that answers it. If there's a big question, it's Peter that asks it. He really doesn't have a lot of time to mess around. Peter seems to be a man of action. And in his disciple Mark, you see that exact same thing reflected in his writing. I'm moving on to Luke chapter 3, and like I said, Mark is very concise, Luke is very, oh, what's, the, what's a good way to say it? Luke's writing is very full. He wants to make sure that you have the details. It's almost the other side of the coin of Mark. Luke is also the guy I was named after, so I feel like I should have a little more loyalty to him. I don't. Um, they're all speaking the word of God, so I love them all. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Atyria and Trachonitis and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into the country around Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. One of the things that was brought to my attention as I was studying to do this is this is how people would prepare 
for a king traveling. They would send out a team of people to make sure that the roads were squared away. They would lower some hills, they would raise up some valleys, they would try to make it as smooth as possible. So John the Baptist is clearing the way for Jesus, who is a king. He is coming to make the, the hills lower, raise the valleys, smooth the way, which is his ministry, which oddly enough, I had never noticed that there is actually a bit of a timeline given. He starts about six months before Jesus. There's an implied timeline. It doesn't explicitly say that, but it would seem that he starts about six months after Jesus. About six months after Jesus is baptized, he's arrested. So John the Baptist's earthly ministry was about a year, after which he spends a couple of years in prison and is eventually beheaded. But his entire ministry, and I had never noticed this, his entire ministry is probably about a year. That's incredible. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, because I tell you, these stones, God can raise these stones up, children, for Abraham. The axe is already on the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers came to him and said, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money, don't accuse people falsely, be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquestionable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the patriarch, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and the other evil things he had done, Herod added to this, this to them all, and he locked them up in prison. Locked him up in prison, I'm sorry, being John. And that doesn't happen right away, but like I said, the Eastern mind has a tendency to tell things thematically and not as much chronologically. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. This is a detail in Luke. In bodily form, this is not a vision. In bodily form. I know I keep saying that. Not a vision. In bodily form. Okay. Like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love with you, with you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. Okay. So, um, this brings me back, and I didn't read the account from John. I'll go ahead and read the account from John. I'm sorry. I know that this is a bit repetitious, but hopefully you can see why I want to be thorough. Again, there is nothing dangerous about hearing too much scripture on a Sunday morning. I do realize that this repeats, and the details are just the vaguest bit different, but not the story, right? There is no danger from hearing too much scripture on Sunday morning. Okay. The next day, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in John 1. I'm actually going to skip right down to verse 35, because you've heard this detail so much that John says, I baptize with water. The man who comes after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, all right. No, I'm at verse 32. Sorry. John gave his testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. There we are. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. 
I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. As I said, John is always emphasizing, whether it's in the Gospel of John, the books of second, or first, second, and third John, or in the book of Revelation, John's lifeblood is showing you that Jesus is the Son of God. It's constant. Along with his obsession with the number seven, it is constant that Jesus is the Son of God. All right. So, back to the beginning. John is baptizing people for repentance in the Jordan River, which is actually a pretty small river. It's rarely deeper than 10 feet, and at its widest is only, I think, 100 yards wide. For a river, that's not so big. It stretches, I believe, 200 miles if you count all the loops in it. This isn't a gorgeous body of water. It's just a little bigger than, than what I would have called a creek growing up. It's not very deep. It's not very long. It's not... It's, it's the Jordan, though. And it comes up over and over in Scripture. I'm not going to say it's not important, but it's not as big and, ma and majestic as I had thought it was. So why is it necessary for Jesus to be baptized? Why does Jesus decide he wants to be baptized? Him being a sinless man, he is without sin. He is the Son of God. Why does he choose to be baptized? Now, the three most common reasons for this is Jesus is baptized publicly to show identification with John the Baptist and the movement John the Baptist has, people confessing their sins and being baptized into repentance. Now, that is a theory many scholars work with, that Jesus is showing that this is a proper thing to do. So he does it as well as a model. And I'm not saying that's wrong. The second reason a lot of scholars say for Jesus becoming baptized is this marks the official start of Jesus' ministry. I fully affirm that. This does mark the official start of Jesus' ministry. All the miracles that Jesus performs happens after this moment. The third reason a lot of scholars give for Jesus being baptized is Jesus is ceremonially clean, cleaning himself. He's cleansing himself to be filled with the Holy Spirit and that priests are required to ceremonially wash before encountering the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, priests are required to wash before encountering the Holy Spirit. So I'm not saying that that is inherently wrong either. So I've just listed three reasons why Jesus was baptized that could be true. And that I have no problem with people thinking. There's a Gnostic theory from the second century that I've heard a lot of Word of Faith pastors say recently that Jesus was just a normal man until he was baptized and then the Holy Spirit touched him. I would like to rebuke that theory right now because that is not scriptural in the slightest. Even though the people saying it have television programs, that is not scripture. That is a false doctrine used to elevate people to a higher position that they have under God. God is sovereign. We're not giving special powers to men. God is powerful. We are people. Again, I'm only bringing it up because I've heard it so much lately and it troubles me. I've actually heard that from maybe two or three different sources recently, and that should have been dead in the second century when it was declared a heresy, but it's still around. People still think that. All of those three, three sound theories and then one that I would suggest you not follow. I would very strongly suggest you don't give any credence to. But scripture most often baptize, or mentions baptism for the forgiveness of sin. So why would a perfect man need to be baptized? So there's the previous three reasons I gave that are all right. What I actually think, though, is slightly different, and it comes from Jesus himself in Matthew. There's an implication in what Jesus says to John. When John is trying to deter him from being baptized, he's like, I need to be baptized by you. Yet you want me to baptize you? And what Jesus replies is, let it be so now. 
it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. What I believe Jesus is saying to John is that he agrees that this baptism was sent from God. God informed John the Baptist he should be baptizing people into repentance. Jesus has followed the laws up to this point. And he continues to. So if God is ordaining that people should be baptized, Jesus is going to do it too. Because Jesus is follow, he's a follower of the law. Jesus is an Orthodox Jewish person. If God ordains it, Jesus did it. So if God ordained baptism for, the, for repentance, Jesus is doing it too, even though he has nothing to repent of. But he says from his own mouth, let it be so now, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And because he says this, John concedes and baptizes him. And as soon as Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends and rests on him. And as Luke says, in bodily form, so that you know that people are seeing this. It is not a vision. The Holy Spirit is physically coming down and resting on Jesus. That's at least the implication I get from, from Luke. And that's why I'm stressing it so much, just because I had always thought a vision, a vision because I just glossed over it. But it appears to me that it is not a vision. It is something that physically happens. In this section of Scripture, the baptism it talks about is simply repentance of sin, fleeing from judgment. The baptism that we have now and celebrate in Christ, which in the, the Great Commission, which is in Matthew 28, It is also a baptism for repentance, a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. But it's a bit more. There are baptisms in Scripture, too, or in history, not as much in Scripture, that were part of people declaring that they were a member of something. It was very much ritualistic. And I don't necessarily believe that's what Jesus was doing with John the Baptist. I do know churches like ours and like people in the Anabaptist tradition have a tendency to baptize people into membership, which I do believe is a healthy practice. But if I could stress something that's much more important than whether you are a Valley View Mennonite or even a Mennonite, is that God does ask you to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So no matter what the sign says outside of the church you attend or do not attend, if you are a Christian, I would highly recommend that you get baptized because my view of Scripture, what I see is that's commanded. You don't have to be a Mennonite to go to, to, go to heaven. You don't have to be a Valley View Mennonite to be a Mennonite. You don't have to be a Mennonite to be a Christian. But it does appear that baptism is a requirement for Christianity. It's something that God strongly emphasizes. So I'm in Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now this is the risen Jesus. This is after Jesus was crucified, was dead for three days, and comes back to life. He is resurrected. So even among his inner group of people that believe he is the Son of God, when they see him bodily resurrected, some doubted. Because we're people, and some things appear too good to be true. And if you've ever purchased a good from a human being, anything, a horse, a car, a house, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Even among his inner circle of believers who truly believe he is the Messiah and the Son of God, when he appears before them, some doubt. That must have been something I ate for lunch. Feel my head. Am I feverish? Boy, that guy looks a lot like Jesus. Anyway, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this is something that's slightly different from John's baptism, is when people were baptized by John, they were baptizing for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, for a washing away of sins. That's still part of our baptism. In baptism, you have this implication that you are receiving or you are declaring true the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You are being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that you are entering into this idea of discipleship. That you are going to follow after Jesus no matter what the cost. And that you are going to try to encourage other people to follow after Jesus as well. This is slightly different than the sermon I heard at summer camp every single year. Slightly different. I'll emphasize, I am all for people asking Jesus into their heart. Please do it if you've never done it. Ask Jesus to abide in you, and he will. But a lot of the messages I heard as a child were all about fire insurance. Accept Jesus so that you don't go to hell. Because I had this idea that Jesus really wanted me to go to hell deep down. Because the kind of Christianity that I was surrounded by taught me that. That Jesus was always looking for a reason for you to screw up so that he could send you to hell. Jesus has bent over backwards historically to give you an option to be in communion with him. God emptied himself of divinity and came as a man to die in our place, which actually I can tie into the Old Testament if you need to hear more. Pull me aside. Because if you just present Jesus died for your sins, that sounds like a self-righteous suicide. Some random guy died for me so I can go to heaven? That's not how it plays out. It ties in perfectly. Man rebelled against God. From the beginning, sin leads to death. There is no forgiveness of sin without blood. And God fulfills this himself because we are unable to. That is a really abridged version of this. But that's what it says here, the whole thing. Is God bent over backwards to bring us back to communion with him? And one of the only things that is commanded of us, one of the only things that is commanded of us is right here in Matthew 28, where it says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Right? Who's Jesus talking about? Himself. I did not become a superhero simply because God has given me some gifting. I am, I'm weak. Physically, I've probably never been weaker, but that's not what we're talking about. I am weak. All authority has been given to Christ Jesus, who abides with me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's something Jesus is telling us to do. Go. And actually, if you go back to the original language, the translation actually is more like, as you go. As you're living your life, make disciples of all nations. You don't have to rent a coliseum and do a big crusade. There's nothing wrong with doing it. Billy Graham did it a lot. It was awesome. Because God called Billy Graham to do that. If God called you to be a mechanic, go turn that wrench and make disciples as you're doing it. If you're a student, study. Make disciples as you're doing it. I can think of very few jobs that are more in the model of what Jesus did for us than garbage man cleaning up after us, taking our refuse away. If you are a garbage man, as you go, make disciples of all nations. And this is the part that's included, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This baptism shows that you are entering into this covenant. 
It is an acceptance of a covenant, of an agreement that this is what we're doing. If you decide someday to become a member of Valley View Mennonite Church, that's awesome. I hope you do. If you don't, if you hate the way I preach and chase bunnies, that's not a problem. If you love Jesus Christ and you've decided that you want to follow after him and make disciples as you go, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Accept this free gift of salvation. And it's only free monetarily because it actually will cost you everything and you'll never be happier than where God takes you. Not because life is perfect. Anyone who tells you that is selling something. Your life will not be perfect. You'll have hope. My life isn't perfect. It's way better than what I deserve. I never expected to be so blessed. And I'm so blessed because I'm in communion with God. I have a wonderful wife. That's a blessing. I own stuff. It's also a blessing. My dog's a jerk, but I love her. Also a blessing. But it isn't the condition of my life that gives me joy. It's my communion with the Father that gives me joy. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness is fleeting. Jesus didn't say in this world you will have happiness. He said in this world you will have troubles. We'll have troubles. You're still here. The thing is, is they're not the same. My troubles aren't the same. They're probably bigger troubles than I've ever had. They don't feel like it. I have peace. Peace that passes understanding. Anyhow. I appreciate you listening to me. And I have so many things about me. I love to study theology. And it isn't to prove I'm right. That's a trapping of studying theology. Is once you start to learn things, you're like, oh, I can prove I'm right because I can take this verse and this verse and this verse and this verse. And there's something to be said for apologetics. I'm not against apologetics, which is what that is. And I'm not against systematic theology. I love it. But what I need to safeguard myself from and what I would encourage you to do highly is when someone brings up theology, I've actually had wonderful Christian people say, oh, I don't have theology. I just read the Bible. And it hurts my head to hear them say that because theology simply means knowing God. It's the ideas you have about knowing God. You're scared of doctrine, I get it. But theology is simply what you know about God and what you learn about God. And the reason why you should study theology, why you should study scripture as much as you can, isn't to prove yourself right. It's not even to be a better evangelist. It's so you know God. It will deepen your worship. It will deepen your love. If you don't know someone, how can you love them? You can love things about them. And how do you learn about somebody? You learn what they've done. You learn what they like to do. You learn the, the characteristics of the personality. That's why you should study theology. There's not a better seat in heaven that I understand. Maybe there is. But I don't think there's better seating in heaven just because you have a great understanding of Greek and Hebrew language or because you can connect all the verses and connect all the dots and find all the loopholes. That isn't what I'm talking about. I have a friend that can argue me under the table from any position on any subject by benefit of personality and their career. And I still think she's wrong. But it isn't because I can beat her in an argument. She has a gifting for argument. I don't know if that's a spiritual gifting, but she has it. I have other friends that are the same way. They're great debaters. I'm not one. I'm not a great debater. And that's fine. You can win an argument and still be wrong. You can lose an argument and still be right. Thank goodness. But that's not why we study theology. We study theology so we know God. It's like reading letters. You go back and you learn. And you look at the history of someone else interacting with someone else. I've learned so many beautiful things about my grandfather who I didn't know in this context 
who would secretly bail people out sometimes, not just from jail, but he would secretly bail people out if they weren't able to make payments and things like that. Never said a word. He wasn't an overly spiritual person while he was alive. But he did it because he's made in the, in the image of God. Right? But I've learned more about him since he passed than I felt like I really knew about him because I only knew one part of him. I was his grandson and he treated me well. That was our entire relationship. Learning how he interacted with strangers or people on the fringes. I feel like I've learned more from learning about my grandfather. I feel like I know him better. The same is true in human relationship as it is in biblical relationship. The more you know about God, the deeper your understanding of who they are is. The deeper your affection for them can be. Anyhow, if you can do so without pain, would you please stand with me? If you hurt, you have my permission to stay seated. Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for all these blessings that you've given us. I thank you for all of these beautiful faces that are made in your image. Father God, I thank you for all the people sitting at home. Lord, I pray that as this unrest and all these pandemic ideas are floating around, I know we are on the whole gambit of ideas about what is proper and what is good, Lord. I pray that you would continue to unite us as the body of Christ, that we would learn to be patient and loving with one another, and that we would be able to con concede to each other on things that truly don't matter. But more importantly, Lord, I want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And I didn't ask Chad, though, he is officially warned because his name is in the bulletin. He's going to come up and do some announcements with us. You can be seated for a moment. Judy, would you mind doing... Yeah, I'm whispering into the microphone as though that's somehow nicer. Judy, would you mind? Yeah, thank you so much. We'll take time for announcements. Is there any announcements being made? All right, I'll do one. This isn't overly pressing, but after our Zoom Bible study finishes on the book of Revelation, we're going to try to have an in-person Bible study here on probably Tuesday nights. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is, in the Dust of the Rabbi, it's a Ray Vanderlaan series that puts the Bible into Jewish context. And I would like to invite you to that, and it'll probably be at, what, what time would be good? Seven. Seven. It's going to be at seven. Well, it'll probably be after Easter, though, okay? So you have some time to prepare for it. I would highly encourage people of all ages to come. Conversations among church go so much better when we have the very young and the very old involved. Because young people catch things older people don't get. Older people catch a lot of things younger people don't get. Let's have some fellowship. I'm, I'm even willing, and I'll put this out there. I am willing to mask up and stay six feet away from everyone. I got a loud voice. Just come. Whatever makes you comfortable, I'm willing to concede that. We can space the chairs out and still look face to face. But whatever we're doing, I want you to come. I want you to fellowship. I want you to discuss scripture. So... That'll be after Easter sometime. And if a different night or a different time works better for, just talk to us, let us know. If you um, have to do it twice, that's okay too. Set seven o'clock, just sound it right. Sounds yeah. beautiful. Anything else? <clears throat> Uh, in the foyer. Youth group at 7.45 on Friday night. Okay, no more announcements. We'll take time for sharing, prayer requests, praises.
I'll start. Uh, what a beautiful sunshiny day we have. It was a little chilly at first, but I'll take I'll take the sunshine for sure. I'm not sure I'm going to repeat all that, but just continue to pray for Jenna King as she Anyone else? Thankful for all our visitors today. For sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Wendy's mother broke and fell her hip, so uh, we need to pray for her. 
Do you know our name? <laughs> Mrs. Brown. <clears throat> okay, anyone else? Uh, if not, we'll have Luke come and lead us in prayer. Again, if you can do so without pain, please stand with me. Father God, again, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for the sunshine that's so appreciated here. Father, I thank you for Jenna King, and I thank you for the news that she's getting about her medication working and that she's getting answers. Lord, I pray that you would have your healing touch on her life, that you would draw her ever closer to you. Father God, I pray that you would continue to touch the rest of the King family as well. Just continue to bless them, Lord. Father God, I thank you for the visitors that we have today, Lord. I pray that you would bless them abundantly. I pray that you would continue to bring people for us to love into our midst. Father God, I thank you for all these blessings, all the ways that you come through for us that we just don't expect or deserve. Father, we thank you for the communion that we have with you. Father, I thank you for uh, Sue and her daughter Joanne's relationship and the direction you're taking at us. They're missing Sue's father. I pray that you would give us a drive to study your word and to know you and to teach others about you. Father God, I pray that you would be with the Joneses. I pray that you would be with Wendy. I pray that you would be especially with her mother today. I pray that you would help her with a broken hip. I pray that you would provide the people to care for her. I pray that you would help her to heal quickly. I pray that you would be glorified somehow in this situation. Father, I pray for the food that we have out there. I pray that you would bless our time of fellowship after this. I pray that you would bless our council meeting, that we make decisions that matter. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, I believe Judy has a blue hymnal in her hand. Wonderful. If you would please circle the sanctuary, we'll sing towards the middle.
message out to the world around us, but you give us the opportunities to grow deeper with you and to shine you to those around us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. All together. Go back and peruse. Feel free. Anyways, that's what I got.